So hello everybody and thank you all so much for coming today. Um, I, I want to start here with a little bit of shameless self-promotion. I apologize. Um, in, in addition to the weekly forecasts that I have been publishing, I have published an overview of the entire year, which is quite comprehensive and includes um, some things I think that probably not everybody is talking about. So I just want to point, to, point it out to you. It's available on Amazon. It's quite affordable. Um, either as ebook or paperback. So I, I hope you take advantage of it. Um, there's a lot of useful information in it um, that can help us all. So today I would like to take a little bit of a different tack with Eris. I've done a lot of writing, a lot of speaking about it over the past couple of years, um, ever since she was actually uh, conjunct Uranus. And uh, I think we're all pretty much aware of the impact that she's had on us. Or maybe we don't understand all of it entirely um, from a mundane astrology perspective as, as how it's, all this is working out. But today I would like to focus uh, more on how Eris is working in each one of our own charts individually. Um, obviously I can't cover every possibility of it, but we're gonna work with some sample charts um, and you know, just kind of get an idea, an overview of, of how to approach this, uh, because it is, it is a little different than some of the other uh, celestial points that uh, we're more familiar with. So, you know, the most uh, famous uh, story about, about Eris, you know, is the mythology. And I, I, I don't really want to get into the mythology today so much, because I have spent a lot of time on it. But, um, the apple itself is the piece that we come away with when we think of Eros, the apple of discord. And, uh, you know, it's interesting because the apple has a, a long history itself throughout all, many different cultures and many different uh, uh, times in history. Uh, you know, it started way back in the beginning with Adam and Eve, uh, was the forbidden fruit, uh, which, you know, held the, the knowledge of good and evil. And, uh, so it, it was you know, heavily, heavily laden with meaning and, and import right from the beginning. Uh, the apple that really comes up today, uh, the golden apple, really comes from the Garden of Hesperides, which was a garden that was tended, uh, actually it, was a, uh, it held a tree, the tree of life, which held the golden apples. And it was a gift from Gaia to Hera um, at the marriage of Zeus. Um, and it, it has held its own place throughout Greek uh, mythology on, on its own, um, besides this one instance. But that is where the golden apple came from. Um, it also comes up in, in the labors of, of Hercules, of Heracles. It was his 11th labor. And he, he was tasked to go and retrieve a golden apple. Uh, unfortunately, the, the garden was, was guarded by a hundred-headed dragon, um, he had to use, you know, some of the guile, which was actually hard for him to come by. He had lots of strength, uh, not a whole lot of smarts, um, but he, he, was, he was able to successfully retrieve one of the apples. Um, we also know from science, um, Isaac Newton, and, and it's how we discovered gravity. You know, the, the story was he was sitting under a tree and the apple fell to the earth, and he said, Eureka, uh, you know, that, that must mean something. Um, you know, from our childhood, we know about Snow White and how she was put to sleep by the, by the apple of, of mortality, the apple of death, um, by the wicked, wicked uh, queen. American, American uh, legends are filled with the stories of Johnny Appleseed. If you're not familiar with him, uh, he was a mythical figure um, who, who kind of roamed across the countryside. He was barefoot and he, he strewed um, apple seeds everywhere that he went. He, he taught the farmers how to cultivate apples, and um, he is supposed to be responsible for the wide cultivation of apples across uh, the American continent. Um, there was also a company that was started, you know, back in the early uh, 60s and 50s, uh, actually 60s and 70s, um, Apple Computer. And it was interesting because it was Steve Jobs who had the original dream uh, that he would place a computer on every desk. Unfortunately, it was Bill Gates who accomplished that, um, but we, the apple still was the source of that dream. And we come to the final um, instance of the apple that it was blamed for the start of the Trojan War. And I, I, I use the word blamed very strongly. Uh, 
I, I don't want to go into this today. It's the subject for another whole talk, and I've actually talked about it in, in the last talk that I did. I, I personally don't believe that Eris was herself responsible for the Trojan War. Um, I, I attribute it to, to Helen. Um, I've had a number of women who have come after me and told me that it's a total patriarchal conception. Um, I, I don't really want to get into it, but um, the, the end result was that Apple not only started the Trojan War, it also was the end of, of Greek uh, classical age. Uh, so it, it was quite impactful. There are also lots of, you know, aphorisms and little maxims that we have about the apple. You know, you're the apple of my eye, and American is apple pie, and apple of the day keeps the doctor away, et cetera. You, everybody's familiar with all of these, the big apple in New York City. And, and the last one, there's only one here, really, that's about a rotten apple. Um, and unfortunately, I think that Eris, to a great degree, has gotten painted with this brush. Um, what, what, what I really propose, you know, in my study of Eris is, is I'm viewing her as really as the shadow of Mars, the shadow of Ares. Um, and as you see, we're going to get through some of the, uh, of the detail about her from her astronomy uh, before we get to the astrology. And uh, she really does represent, she's very closely linked with that Martian energy um, from a feminine perspective uh, and, and more, more in his shadow. So it, it's interesting because from the very beginning, Eris was born in controversy. Um, her, she was discovered by a team led by Mike Brown, who's discovered most of the uh, Kyber Belt um, bodies that have recently you know, come to light over the past uh, 10 years or so. Um, she was orbiting out past the orbit of Neptune, and he discovered she was as, each, as large or larger than Pluto. And it, it, was, it was a very contentious, uh, very contentious because this discovery, as you'll see, um, and most of us probably already know this story, would, would literally shake up the world of astronomy and astrology alike. And I think it's particularly sensitive to us EA astrologers, excuse me. It's interesting, she was quite elusive. She was, her images were captured a year before she was actually identified in any of the films. Uh, because of her extremely slow planetary speed. You know, they're using a technology where they're looking for uh, actually movement in, in, these, uh, in, in the, the, uh, the lights that they can receive you know, over, over periods of time. And because she has an over 500 year orbit, she didn't seem to move and they didn't notice her. Um, she was actually occulted by Sedna about a year later and when Sedna was discovered, Eris was also discovered about the same time. Um, and because she was the same size as Pluto, she was considered to be the 10th planet. And, uh, you know, there's a, again, there's a lot of astronomical history about the search for the 10th planet. Um, it's, it's why Lowell actually funded and built the observatory that most of these planets were found, were, were found with. Um, it, it, they believed that, that there was just a belief that there was more out there and they were searching for it. And, and she was one of the first that they found. They, they, haven't, they haven't found that mysterious uh, Nibiru, um, but yet they, they're discovering lots of other, lots of other things. Uh, but because there was a prospect of other objects of similar size being discovered, um, there, there was a, had a problem defining, you know, what was this, what, what, what was her classification? Um, but they, she was classified as a planet because at the time Pluto was a planet and she was the same size, so she was fit into the same, into the same category. Um, and Eris was proposed and it was assigned uh, after an unusually long period when she really just had some, uh, you know, the, the uh, generic uh, classification that's, a, that's assigned to a celestial body when it's discovered. Um, but Brown decided that it, the object had been, been a, a planet for so long that it deserved a Greek or Roman um, a nomenclature, just like the other planets. Um, but due to the uncertainty over whether the object would be classified as a planet, and because different nomenclature pr procedures apply to these different classes of objects, the, different, uh, the di decision on what to name the object had to wait for the International Astron Astronomical Union ruling. Uh, that, that's the organization that determines all the classifications and, and uh, assigns the, the, uh, the names to all the planets. And as a result, she became, for the time being, known as, as Xena, 
um, who was um, the informal name that uh, was inspired by the title character of, of a television series, Xena, the Warrior Princess. So from the beginning, she already had a warrior aspect and she, there was already a lot of contention and controversy, controversy about uh, who, 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 she, who she really was. So, excuse me. So uh, because of all this uncertainty, the IAU delegated a group of astronomers to actually develop a precise de uh, definition of what was a planet. Um, and in 2006, um, Eris and Pluto were classified as dwarf planets that created a new category. Uh, the, the criteria was that a planet had to be uh, pretty much spherical, it had to be round, and it also had to have enough of gravity to be able to clear this, its space in its orbit. Um, and they felt that Pluto, which was on the edge of the Kuiper belt, I suppose, just wasn't clearing its space, it wasn't big enough, it didn't have the, the necessary gravity um, to, to clear everything out that was around it. Um, so it was kind of demoted, but uh, we in this room know that that's not true. Um, and at the same time, the asteroid series, which is perfectly round, was promoted in status and reclassified as a dwarf planet, along with Homea, Makimaki, and Sedna. Um, she was finally named Eris, uh, given the official name, but this whole history behind her, again, is, is indicative of the energies that she carries. There's a disruptive quality to her. Um, there, there is a, a, there's a contention, there's controversy that she brings. Um, and, you know, we all know in our own lives, um, you know, that controversy and contention are not always something that's bad. Um, it, it's almost a Iranian energy where there, there's a shattering of what's become crystallized. So some new understanding can, can take its place. And I think that in some ways she fills this role. I, I see her actually more in, in, in terms of uh, com coming to terms with things that have just gone way beyond their shelf life and, and precipitating whatever circumstances and necessities uh, ha have, to, have to occur in order for changes to occur. And um, I, I certainly uh, apply that to the world where the time space we're passing through in the world right now, where uh, many, many of us feel that a lot of the things that are coming to light are things that have been uh, you know, swept beneath the rug for centuries, if not millennia, and it all needs to be exposed. So I'd like to I'd like to look at some of the astronomy because um, the astronomy does inform our astrology, and we can learn a lot from understanding her as a physical body in the sky, um, as much as we can learn from her, her history and her transits and her her effects on human experience. Uh, she's the most massive and second largest dwarf planet in the solar system, and she's the ninth most massive object actually directly orbiting the sun. And you see that there's a scale, the, the, the image that's below is, is to scale, those are astrological, excuse me, astro astronomical units, AUs. And you, if you can see down here, this is Pluto, which is the outer range of our solar system. And there is an equal distance before the next body that's been discovered. I am not familiar with Goblin or Biden, um, and then up comes Sedna, where we've all had uh, getting a lot of information about Sedna. And then here's Eris way out here. And then this was, uh, you see, this was uh, discovered in 2018, VG18 and far out, um, which is so far out there. Um, so Eris became the, the second most distant observed solar system object. And at the time of this writing, it's also the largest object which has not yet been visited by any, any spacecraft. I'm hoping very soon that they're gonna get out there and we'll get a really good picture of her. Uh, the observations show that she's almost a perfect twin of Pluto in size. Um, her mass is about 0.27% of the Earth's mass and about 27% more than the dwarf planet Pluto. And that, that's a really significant uh, numerically, if anybody's into numerology, but that's three, three cubed. Uh, number 27, that's a significant number. I, I, I don't believe that anything astronomical or astrological is accidental or coincidental. Um, though Pluto is slightly larger by volume. 
and she's probably the, the largest rocky body covered with a, uh, with a thinly, uh, a relatively thin mantle of ice. She's not gas. She's, she's a big rock. And it, her surface is extremely reflective. She reflects 96% of the light that falls on it. Um, I, I often, uh, you know, mention, you know, comment to my, my clients that the universe is reflective. And, and here is Eris, um, really giving us a good example of a, a reflective cosmos. It's even brighter than fresh snow on Earth, um, which makes it one of the most reflective objects in the solar system. So as I said, the astronomy, the astronomy informs our astrology. Um, she has a highly elliptical orbit on a very long orbit, which, went, which is what made it so difficult for her to originally uh, be observed. Uh, of her 534 year orbit, she spends one years, roughly 20% 20 of that orbit in the sign of Aries. Um, so, it, you know, she's very comfortable in, in, her, brother's, in her brother's house. Uh, mythically, she is Aries' brother, Aries, not Aries, Aries, the, the Greek god of war. Uh, this, this orbital period lends tremendous intensity and density to the relationships that Eris has with Saturn and with uh, the uh, Uranus, which are both the tradition, which are both the rulers of Uranus, which again brings a Uranian, uh, to, from my perspective, a Uranian uh, complexity to her archetype. Um, because her, it, it, she's in Aries for 120 years, that's you know, three 28-year cycles of uh, Saturn, sometimes more, uh, if he goes retrograde a couple of times, and, uh, and uh, twice, uh, two 84-year cycles of Uranus with, within one single Aries transit, uh, which is why these transits in Aries are, have been so totally dramatic. Um, I, I've recorded a lot of the history of, of the Aries transits uh, previous to this one, and um, I've detailed a lot of the things that have happened in this, this uh, transit as well. It's, it, all, all this information is on, on my website um, for evolutionaryastrology.com. So I want to look at a few charts. Um, I, I think we have to understand that when we look at any celestial object, whether it's a planet or an asteroid um, or, or a, uh, one of the lights, one of the luminaries, we're basically working with the same procedure. We're, we would look at its, uh, the ruler, uh, uh, you know, of the sign that it's in. We would look at the house, assuming we know the time in which the person was born, uh, look at aspects to the ruler. Um, it does, Eris does not, has not been assigned a rulership. Um, I am associating uh, Eris with Aquarius and Aries, but I'm not, certainly not going to say, go as far as to say that she rules either of those two uh, signs, but there's definitely a relationship, a very strong relationship with them in the way that she's working, uh, especially Mars. So uh, this, this is Johannes uh, Kepler, and uh, I think we all know about Kepler. He's, he's uh, responsible for uh, uh, some tremendous uh, astronomical uh, uh, realizations early in the 17th century, uh, his, his laws of planetary motion. Basically, uh, you know, he was, uh, he, he described, he, he changed astronomy because he realized that the planets did not move in circular orbits. Um, it, it was, you know, one thing for, you know, to recognize that, um, that we have a heliocentric uh, solar system, that the planets and, and, and the sun do not, and the moon do not all rotate around the earth. Um, we, I think we all know how long that took to get overthrown. Um, though astrologically, we still work with a, a geocentric theory because we stand on the earth, we don't stand on the sun. And the, so the planets do revolve around us. But, uh, you know, for, for millennia, that, that was not considered to be science. And um, so he was responsible for determining the elliptical orbits of, of the, uh, the planets. And that, that was huge. I mean, it was a total upset to everything that was known at the time. Um, his work proved to be, it was actually one of the foundations for Newton's theory of gravitation. He, he was a student of a gentleman named Tycho Brahe, I think that's how you pronounce his name, who was an astronomer, astrologer, and alchemist, and he himself was also all of those things. His mother was a healer, 
and an herbalist. Um, he was introduced to astronomy at a very early age. At, at age six, he observed the great comet. His mother took him there, and he 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 was able to actually observe it. So from from you know almost from the time he was born, he was connected to the stars. So if we look at look at the astrology in his chart, he has Eris in Taurus uh, retrograde in his twelfth house. Uh, he, he was a practical visionary. He was looking for universal truth. Now, you, a Taurus is really what's essential to us. It's, uh, you know, what, what we think, you know, what we need to survive. And this became his, his personal uh, essential need, which was really to understand, the, you know, the truth about astronomy. Uh, it became his essential work. He had uh, Venus conjunct the sun in his eighth house, and Venus is the dispositor of Eris. So that, you know, that, that Taurian energy um, was quite strong. Uh, Uranus, Mercury, well, Uranus and Mercury, which is the ruler of this chart, the ruler of this ascendant, are in the seventh house, someone Capricorn. Um, so in essence, you know, we use the balance word here. He, he, he balanced uh, astronomy. He, he, he found, he, he realized something, he, he found a place where astronomy was out of balance, and, and he, he kind of corrected it. Um, he had a compelling search for truth. His Pluto and Pisces um, conjunct Jupiter in the tenth house. I mean, he brought that directly up into his work and to excuse me, and to how how he projected his, himself in the world. It, um, it was right there at the top of his chart. Was that was that search for truth, and and Neptune on his ascendant um, really made it ultimate truth, especially uh, opposite Vesta in the seventh house. So we, we can see in, in this chart, I mean, this is not a man who um, was mean or hateful or, uh, you know, did anything that was destructive. He, he used Eris um, really to uh, realign uh, our, our basic worldview of, of astronomy and how the planets are actually working and, and interworking with each other. Um, it, it was a huge change and, um, Eris in his 12th house in Taurus clearly was, was uh, central to, to that work. So Cesar Chavez um, was an American farm worker, um, a labor leader, civil rights activist, and co-founded the United Farm Workers. Um, you know, a tremendously uh, powerful and um, active man to, to find equality among uh, people who had no equality at the time. Uh, they, they, they were itinerants, they were uh, of, from another culture, uh, spoke another language perhaps, came from another country. Uh, there was nobody there to take their part. And, and he, he really spent his life um, empowering them as, as a group. Uh, his 11th house Pluto and Cancer is ruled by a 7th house Pisces moon. And it's conjunct Uranus Eris at zero degrees of Aries. Uh, you don't get more Aries, uh, more Aries in Aries than that. So you can see that he, he you know, he, he was deep-seated passion and vision uh, that he brought to his work. It, it, he, he had that uh, Iranian inspiration. He, the, the, the stuff that came to him of its own, seem, uh, seemingly of his own volition, uh, we, we just popped up and, you know, conjunct his son. I mean, it just became part of who he was. Um, and it's, it was also, his son is also conjunct Sedna. Um, Sedna, whatever Sedna ch uh, touches or is touched by, uh, uh, brings us an increased consciousness. So it, it, he, he not only raised, it, it was not only a consciousness or raising, raising uh, experience and e evolution for him, but he also raised the consciousness of uh, the world around him. Um, Uranus and Eris also form a stellium uh, with that, that airy sun. Um, his 10th house Mars in Gemini forms a, a, a waning last quarter square to his Pisces moon and a partile gibbous opposition to his 4th house Ceres in Sagittarius. So here we see, you know, a lot, it, 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 he, was, he was an intellect. He, he was not just a farm worker. He wasn't just a laborer. Um, he, he was a thinker. He was, he was a realizer of uh, philosophical realities, but yet he, he, he grounded them. They were all grounded in, in something real. He, he brought it down literally to the earth. Uh, his, uh, 
his initiative and his love of the land uh, drove him to air his grassroots message for worker equality until it surfaced in the national media. He kept banging that drum until he was heard. Um, eventually, he became an icon and he was a role model for other labor organizers across the world, across the country, um, not necessarily agricultural. Um, his motto, um, down here, I have a, I can move this so I can read it. Um, si si se puede, uh, yes, it is possible. He had this positive outlook, um, which which is you know totally reflected um, in his in his chart. Uh, Saturn Sagittarius down in his fourth house, uh, uh, they're very very uh, grounded and responsible um, to to really um, find the truth within himself and then to be able to express it in the world. Samuel Hahnemann, really interesting character. I don't know if anybody is familiar with him. Samuel Hahnemann was the realizer of homeopathy. Um, he, was, he was dissatisfied with the state of medicine. He had studied medicine. Um, he was working as, uh, with, as a physician, um, but he, he could not stomach um, some of the practices like bloodletting uh, that he felt did the patient more harm than good. Um, this is a quote here. He said, my sense of duty would not easily allow me to treat the unknown pathological state of my suffering brethren with those unknown medicines. The thought of becoming in this way a murderer or malefactor towards the life of my fellow human beings was most terrible to me. So terrible and disturbing that I wholly gave up my whole practice in the first years of my married life and occupied myself solely with chemistry and writing. So he, he walked away from his medical practice because the, the, the practices at the time were so important to him that he, he made the conscious decision, proactive decision, that he had to find another route. But after giving up his practice in 1784, he, he decided that he was going to find the causes of, of what was wrong with medicine from his perspective. Um, and while he was translating a treatise on uh, Materia Medica, Materia Medica is the uh, the book which really catalogs the history of pharmacy, he encountered a claim that this cinchona, a bark of a Peruvian tree, or cinchona, I guess you pronounce it, was, was effective in treating malaria because of its astringency. Uh, now, so, I mean, it didn't say anything about it, obviously, as being a homeopathic treatment, but he tested it on himself, and he noted that it induced malaria-like symptoms in himself. So he concluded that naturally it would do that in any healthy individual. Um, and this is the basis of homeopathy, that, that, that the like, like heals like. Um, so he, this led him to postulate the healing principle that that which can produce a set of symptoms in a healthy individual can create the sick individual who is manifesting a similar set of symptoms. Um, and, and again, it changed the way that medicine uh, would practice homeopathy really has, uh, does not have the roots here that it has overseas. Uh, I don't know if anybody, you know, if you go to London or Paris, uh, every street corner, there is a homeopathic uh, shop, uh, unlike here, where you have to actually find somebody who practices homeopathy, if you're lucky, in your community. But the principle that like cures like became the, the basis for this approach to medicine, and, and he named it homeopathy. Uh, meaning similar, similar um, uh, healing. So, so he has Eris and John Pluto in his 12th house on his ascended in Sagittarius, opposing Ceres in Gemini in his sixth house. So, I mean, here, uh, you, here we see that, you know, a compelling need to actualize the truth of his inner, inner understanding and grant his ideas in practical work regarding healthcare. Uh, he's, uh, it, 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 that Pluto, Eris clearly was just an overwhelming inner compulsion uh, for him. He, he could not ignore it. It was strong enough to cause him to, to give up his practice. Um, and yet it was also strong enough to make him pick up the reins again and to find a way that he could come back to with a different understanding, but he had to do the work. He had to do the research. Um, this is clearly a, clearly a Sagittarius uh, Gemini um, uh, commitment and dynamic. 
um, it, it's ruled by, it is, is Sag, it's ruled by Jupiter retrograde in Virgo. Um, and we all know that Virgo is of that health. And it's in a part tile trying to Chiron and Capricorn. So, I mean, it, it just keeps piling up here in terms of taking responsibility and being a healer um, and working with healthcare. Um, it, it, it's, uh, it, again, and, you know, this is, it's, it was a, an un unavoidable, you know, trajectory. Uh, you know, our, our life path is, is not something that we can, you know, alter. We, we may, it may take us, you know, many, many, many years to fulfill it or many lifetimes to really get around to it. But once it kicks in, it takes hold. It, it, it literally grabs us um, and, and compels us to, uh, to work towards something that we know we need to do. He, he, and he made, you know, his life choices according to that deep commitment. You know, Juno Sagittarius, the first house, is definitely somebody who's committed to the truth. Uh, it's undeniable. And to his own essential values and priorities. Um, and uh, all that Capricorn. Morris, Morris um, is ruled by a dark, dark moon. Um, if you see here, that the moon is um, applying to the sun. It's, it's balsamic, and it's what it's known as a dark moon. It's, it's you know, maybe a day even less than a day before the new moon. And, it, it, and it's a greatly intensified um, time period where, where uh, things just have to be completed, where things just must come to some form of, of resolution or completion. And it, it intensified his inner compulsion. Um, it, it was the, the emotional, um, the emotional uh, impact that it had on him and the emotional uh, mag the magnetic Pulled that this was for him uh, again was undeniable, um, and it, it, he it, as a result he embodied his beliefs and his intellectual understanding into his life's work in medicine. Um, and you see here I have a, a comment. He, he he created a schism in me, in, in medical thought. Um, that's clearly an heiress uh, dynamic. But again, it was not done violently. It was not done with any uh, you know uh, malevolence. Um, it was done with, with you know, for, for the good of all beings everywhere. Uh, so Eris does have this capability. It's, 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 she's not all bad. Susan B. Anthony. Okay. Social reformer. This, by the way, is a, a zero Aries chart, 12 noon, because her, her birth time is unknown. So uh, we, we, we can't assume that these uh, planetary placements are where they were at birth. Um, but we, we can work with them from a, uh, uh, you know, an archetypal perspective. So she, she was a social reformer, women's rights activist, uh, and had a pivotal role in the women's suffrage movement very early on. Uh, she, she was one of the, the initial people who, in, in the United States who really brought this to, to uh, public attention. And again, were willing to sacrifice much of um, what was important in order to fulfill what they felt they needed to, to say. Um, Herreris is conjunct Mercury and Aquarius in, a, in, in, uh, in the ninth house here. It's, uh, I, I should not actually have these house placements, I apologize. Um, but but it's, it, Eris conjunct Mercury and Aquarius is clearly going to be an outspoken public speaker. Um, she's not, she's not going to hold her tongue and it, it's going to be more than just speaking um, she, she was, you know, truly, truly an activist. Um, she has Uranus and Sagittarius conjunct Neptune and Capricorn. Um, again, this, this is a, an individuating dynamic, you know, based on her vision. Um, she, she grew into herself, uh, you know, based on um, what, what it is that her dreams and uh, she was getting from, from the inside, not what she was reading in the newspaper. She was born a Quaker. Um, so, I mean, that was, that's an important part of her uh, philosophical foundation. Uh, her family shared the passion for social reform and supported anti-slavery. And as a matter of fact, her father was an abolitionist and, and also a temperance advocate. Um, she had Morris and Cancer retrograde. Um, so again, you know, she took the part, you know, of, of uh, women, families, and, and about gender issues, especially, especially in a retrograde uh, dynamic. She, she was very focused on what was important for, you know, for families uh, more than what was uh, important for, uh, you know, building empires. And her, uh, her Aquarius heiress is a bi-quintile Pallas Athena um, in Cancer. 
so again, you know, here's more of that, that family familial, familial uh, influence on her and the need to, um, to really upset the apple cart in terms of gender equality, in terms of uh, women's uh, equality. Um, and, it, you know, we know that Pallas also is, is, uh, is, is constantly speaking to us if we're listening. Um, there, there was, and she had an emotional embodiment of the higher messages that she was receiving. And, and she left the world as that spiritual warrior, um, as Pallas, but, but her sword was the pen uh, and her sword was the microphone. So I have to have, to have one baddie here, I'm sorry, um, because we, we have to see how this works the other way around. So here's Charles Vanson, and it really doesn't get worse than that. Um, his, his early history is phenomenally difficult. Uh, his mother was only 16 years old, and he, he never knew his father. His mother married several times, and each father was worse than the one before. Um, they were both his mother and his stepfather were sentenced to a prison term for grand larceny. Uh, when he was nine years old, he set his school on fire. At age 13, he was placed in a strict school for delinquent boys. It was the first of many run by the Catholic Church. He committed his first crime at age 18. He was sent to two different reform schools. Um, he, he was he and then he was actually schooled in crime by a friend's father who was a professional thief. Um, he was gang raped and beaten in school and he ran away 18 times. He himself went to prison twice. Um, and in early 1969, we, we know how this all worked out, uh, that he encouraged, he, 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 he formed a cult and he encouraged his followers to start a race war uh, by committing murders in the Los Angeles area and um, making the killings appear to be racially motivated. Um, you can see this grand, grand cross of his chart you know, right across the axes in, in, in his chart, it's uh, you know, quite powerful. Uranus uh, opposite uh, Jupiter and uh, the moon on his north node uh, opposite Pluto. Uh, it's uh, very, very powerful and, and, and really from you know, any psychological perspective, it ends up being very, very messed up. Uh, you know, I'm sure that there were other people who were born in the hospital next to him and weren't necessarily um, as malicious as he was, or as devious, or as uh, you know, as dangerous, um, but they probably weren't also born to sixteen-year-old mothers and you know, schooled in crime and sent to prison many times. His heiress is in Aries, not in the hundred and twelfth test. I apologize for that typo. Um, and it's ruled by more that Mars and Neptune down in his fifth house. It's a total savior complex. He, he really felt that somehow he was born to fix it all. He, he was gonna start a race war because he thought that somehow that, that would solve, you know, all, all the, the ills of the world. You know, that was his thinking. Eris is trying Pluto and it's conjunct Lilith and Cancer um, and Ceres is conjunct the lunar staff node in his, in his Leo fourth house. Um, so, you know, again, you, you know, you put Pluto together with Lilith, um, it, it, it's not necessarily a good combination. Uh, he, he was clearly not going to tell the line. He was not going to be conventional. He was not going to uh, be compliant. Um, he was going to be as disruptive and as angry and as uh, mean as he could possibly be. Uh, and the Grand Cross falls, falls, falls across the axis of his chart. The moon, the lunar nodes, uh, Uranus, uh, Pallas ascending. Pluto, Ceres, Lilith, Mercury, Jupiter. It's, you know, it's quite a salad of, uh, you know, planetary uh, uh, things. Uh, um, his, his Pluto and Cancer is ruled by his moon in Aquarius. So even though, you know, we can look at Pluto and Cancer and say, well, you know, maybe that could, you know, give him some heart or some compassion. His, his moon in, in Aquarius up there, uh, clearly on his north node, and his, his nodes are stationed, um, really intensifying and drilling down, re really brought out the, the anger and the need to dis make, make as much trouble as he possibly could from, from almost from the time he was born. Uh, his Jupiter is conjunct Mercury and Mercury is stationed direct. 
So again, he's got another, another station going on here, and, and it's right on his descendant, conjunct Jupiter, or in Scorpio, really, you know, just adding more uh, pain and uh, anguish to uh, his, his, his uh, fourth house Pluto. I mean, he really saw himself as, you know, per, perhaps as, you know, quite satanic. Uh, it may have been the way he really considered who he was. It's hard to say. Um, he, and the moon is conjunct his lunar south node um, in his ninth house. And it's, you know, again, the, the nodes are stationed. So he had a very, very disruptive personality. He thrived on chaos. Um, and, and we all know the results of it. Um, there's a great movie out there uh, that you've probably all seen, you know, One Day in the, uh, one day in the Life of Hollywood, uh, which really tells the story. Uh, Brad Pitt won, a, won an Academy Award for his role in it. Um, I, I think that that's pretty much all I've got. Um, and I guess, you know, we have time. I'd love to open the, open the floor to questions or comments. Hi, Daniel. Um, I know you've spoken about this before. What about Eris in, the, in Trump's chart? I'm sorry, could you say that again? Eris in the chart of Donald Trump? Well, I was going to use Donald's, uh, I don't know, call him Don. I was going to use this chart, uh, Linda, but um, I am so emotionally engaged with how I feel about him that I really have to avoid his topic altogether. And I'm, I'm not blowing off your question. I just, I just can't talk about him or his chart. He's, he, he's, um, he has confounded me in the sense of, um, I'm, I'm overwhelmed at what he's capable of and I, and I cannot objectively look at him in any way. Uh, that's the best answer that I can give you. But, but clearly we, we can see, you know, even without looking at his chart, just, you know, it, it's been said that, that we can learn a lot about anybody. We can learn everything we need to know about somebody just by observing them. And even without knowing his chart, just observing this man, you have to know that there's something here that's really out of place, something really, really, really strange. I'm thinking about the phase between Pluto and Eris which would be uh, the last quarter. Sure. I can bring up this chart if you want to. If you want me to. Um, if you like, yes. Yeah, I've got There he is. So, you know, first of all, his heiress is his eighth house, okay? Um, and it's in Aries. We, we all, everybody that we know that, that's alive or has been alive at any time in our lives has Uranus, has Eris in Aries. Um, it's been there since 1926. It's going to be there until 2024. Um, so th this is something which is really pretty global for, you know, all of our generations. Uh, but the fact that it's in his eighth house and it's opposite Neptune, uh, really is, is, I think is what's key here. Um, Daniel, also, Daniel, yes. sorry, sorry. Um, I think you're looking at Vesta in the eighth. No. Um, isn't Eris in this chart is in the 12th house. You still got Charles Manson's chart up. Oh, right. I'm sorry, do I have the wrong time? 1024 uh, Wrong chart. The wrong chart. This is Charles Manson. We're not. We're still seeing your your presentation. Oh, oh, oh sorry. Yeah, oh, oh, got to do oh, a new oh, share. Oh, oh. <laughs> sorry. Thanks, Sue. Thank you. That's that. That's it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Sorry about that. So, so you you you, you know this. Uh, um, 
this, this opposition, um, and you know, there's also a grand cross there, uh, you know, with, with uh, Mercury and Pallas. So it's, it, it's quite intense, but I think it's that Eris opposite uh, Neptune that, that really throws it because his Neptune is a shadow Neptune. He's one of the people on the planet who every time they open the map, no matter what they're saying, I know he's lying. Um, and, and that's, you know, clearly in, in Neptune's shadow. Uh, and, and he uses it to his best advantage and our greatest disadvantage. Thanks, Daniel. Um, so for many of us of the Leo generation, we would have um, a trine between Eris and Pluto. And, and for the other generations after us, um, it would be in that, um, you know, last section of the Zodiac, which would be the last quarter square, balsamic phase. Um, yes. And where are we up to now? Uh, Eris is at 23 degrees. Aries. So, you know, it's, 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 squaring, it's squaring Saturn Pluto right now. Mm. Okay, yeah. You can look at that chart too, if you would like. Yes, that would be great. Now, do we have any questions from our audience? Yes, I have a question. Okay, Wanda, go ahead. No, less month. Um, I was wondering, uh, do you have some tips for um, those that have the sun in Aries conjunct Eris? Tips on how to uh, handle the energy? I, I, I think the best answer that I, that I, I can give you, um, that is really a universal answer, is, is really a life lesson. Um, you know, when, you know, when we're, you know, moving along what we consider to be our trajectory, our, our, our path, and all of a sudden it takes a left turn or a right turn, um, it, it mostly we, we, we consider it to be, you know, a problem or, you know, that it's not where we thought we were going. Uh, but most often, you know, in my life, I, I have found that when I, Accept, you know, a sur uh, surrender to that that turn that's that's going that direction, whether I want it to go that way or not, ends up taking me in a direction that I wouldn't have gone on my own. But when I got there, I was glad it happened. Okay, does that, does that kind of make sense? Yes, it does because it seems like um, if you already have the sun in Aries and then you have Aries conjunct Aries and other Aries energy like planets in the first house and Mars in Aries, it just seems like it's Aries on jet fuel. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, that, yeah, that's, that's nuclear fuel. <laughs> now that, is, that, is that your chart? Yes. Yes. It, it, you know, it's, it's a tremendous focus on self-actualization is what it is. It, it, it's, it's, you know, it, it, you're, it, it's a sole intention to really um, become who, who your soul is intended to become and to have the, uh, excuse my French, the cojones, to, to really walk that path because, you know, at times it's not going to be easy. Um, and, you know, you know, and because there's so much passion, there's, there's, there's you know, a lot of emotional stuff. Um, you, you have to, um, uh, excuse me one second, I need to plug my computer in. It's about to go, go belly up. Um, You know, it, it, and it's about choices um, too. You know, all, all that Aries energy is really about the choices that we make. And it, you know, it, it's almost as if you, you, the choice, some of the choices that have come up have been very, very difficult because there's so much uh, baggage perhaps uh, attached to it. I mean, does that sound, you know, familiar? Um, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not a clean cut decision. It's not easy to make that choice because maybe you're pulled in more than one direction. 
And, you know, there could be all kinds of subterranean things that are just, you know, bubbling up that, that are confusing. Um, that's kind of what I get. Oh, yes, that makes sense. <laughs> but, but, you know, it, it's, it's about finding that focus. Right? Clearly, that find, finding that focus. Tell, tell me again, what, what, house, what house is all that in? Uh, the sun, I have the sun, Eris, uh, and Mars, and Juno all conjunct in the eighth house. And um, I'm the, of the Uranus-Pluto conjunction in the first house. Yeah, I, I have I have um, moon moon and uh, and uh, Eris also in my eighth house, and so I, I've got a part of that going on. The eighth house is hard. The, the eighth house is no question is a challenge uh, because it kicks your butt uh, it, because you're you're in, you're in that space where you're facing something that you that you haven't wanted to or haven't been able to face, and you are compelled to, to just go forward. So it's very difficult. It's, you, you can't go backwards and, and, and you don't want to go forward. Um, so, so it, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's clearly very stressful. Um, but I, I think it's about, you know, uh, Juno in, in Aries, it's, it's making a commitment to yourself, Juan, but it, it's really about, you know, choosing yourself above, you know, anything else that's going on and, and finding what it is that, um, Really, it really is, is important for you. Uh, what, what really is essential, what really is uh, is the choice that you want to make from, from your heart, not necessarily your head. And to get passionate about it and be committed to it. Thank you. That's my two cents. Can we speak briefly on uh, the suppression of anger? because Eris is in Aries and it has been for a very long time. And I guess that could be one of the main issues because it's really not cool to, well, it's not cool to really express our anger. Um, there's, there's a good way to express it and there's another way, right? So could, any thoughts on that? Are you asking me? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, th well, I think I think that no matter where our Mars is and where our Aries is, we're, we're, that's going to come up for us. I don't know that that's you know necessarily isolated or um, you know uh, consigned uh, restricted to the eighth house. Um, anger management is, is something I think that we all have to deal with. Uh, there's no question about it. Um, But, but yeah, I, you know, with, with Eris and Morris, uh, how, how far apart are they? Um, I'm talking about my chart now. Oh, and okay. so it's a trine between, um, well, the current Eris, there's a trine with natal Pluto. And, um, and it's um, a disseminating phase, which I think, see, Eris has not really been a problem for me um, because of my Pluto in the 10th house because I'm expressing that in society and, you know, the expression of anger is not really a cool thing, but at the same time, there's suppression going on and it's very unhealthy, can be very unhealthy. So um, I've had to learn that it is okay. It is a natural emotion and, um, and also the, there is a way to express it in society with other people that is not going to be threatening. Right. So there are lessons. Right. right. No, I agree with you 100%. It, it's, it's, you know, it, it's finding the way to express your anger, but yet to still be truthful and still say what's necessary and still be kind. I think exactly. those are the three, three tests that we have to put everything through before, you know, those words come out of our mouth. And um, it, it, you're right, if, if we suppress our anger, we just create an internal conflict within ourselves. Um, so it, we, we have to express it. And I think that anger actually can be a healthy emotion. There have, I think there's a lot of anger in the world right now, no matter what country we're living in, the, the degree of authoritarianism and the repression and you know, all kinds of things that are going on, you know, are, are making us angry. 
there's no two ways about it. If we're not angry, there's something wrong. Uh, but we have to find the, um, the channels through which we can express that anger, whether it's, you know, getting politically active or, you know, journaling or writing, you know, some way to release that, what we're holding inside so that it's no longer inside, it's come out and, and it's got its own space in which to exist without tearing us apart or hurting somebody else. Exactly. And seeing that uh, all the asteroids are feminine in nature, um, to accept the fact that we have this, these emotions and to really accept our anger and to embrace it and, you know, allow it to express itself as part of us and as not something to be suppressed, but just let it happen. Um, I think that's really important. Right, right. But to let it, let it to come out so that, you know, again, if it fulfills those three filters, you know, is it necessary, is, is it kind, and is it truthful? And is, and well, even if it isn't, isn't, even if it isn't, it, you know, it, it needs to be expressed within oneself and accepted, no matter what kind of level it's on, it's there. It could be, you know, it could be intense anger. It, it needs to, to, to be accepted. Otherwise, it'll just be shoved down even further, right? Well, there's also, you know, metaphysical way to deal with all this, you know, especially with, you know, often, you know, a client will come and they have a parent who's gone or a parent who's, who's estranged or a sibling who's estranged. And, you know, my suggestion is always to, you know, kind of write them a letter, you know, write, write it all down, but not mail it to them. You know, express everything that you feel, get it all out, you know, on paper and, and so that it's physical and you, you've said it, but, but you don't have to tell them because it's in the field. Uh, you know, once you write it and once you express it, it's in the field and they may pick it up, they may not pick it up. At that point, it doesn't matter, but you've released it. And I think that that's what's important. That's excellent advice. Thank you, Dan Daniel. And do we have any final questions from our audience? I did have one other question. Um, would Eris be more of an, I, I kind of see Eris uh, similarities between Eris and Uranus and even Eris and Pluto, um, which can be thought of as the loners and the outsiders. But it seems like Eris is even more of an outsider than, than those two archetypes. I think that's a great observation. Um, I, and again, I think that we, we, that partially comes from the astronomy because she is out there. It's no question. Um, you, you know, we, we have to come, you know, come back to you know, the concept that these outer planets get discovered as our consciousness is able to, to process what it is they have to tell us. And you know, we're still in, a, in many ways a, a very juvenile stage of consciousness on the planet because we, we can't really directly work with anything past Saturn. Um, it, it, unless Uranus and Pluto and Neptune um, come and uh, you know, connect with one of our inner planets, it, we, it, it, they, we really don't get what it is that they have to tell us. We, we, we cannot hear their messages directly. And, and Eris, I think, is also, you know, in that same, you know, same field. Um, she's, these are very, very high frequencies, and we're not necessarily attuned um, to, to bring them in, you know, with, with the full volume, so to speak. Um, but yes, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think that she has a similarity, definitely has a similarity to Pluto. We know that she's the same size. She's very similar. She's been compared to Pluto. Um, her discovery was, was all about her, her similarity to Pluto. Um, so yes, uh, there's no question that the, these are all karmic, um, karmic energies that, that are very, very intense. But it's, I, I, I think, you know, it's what I said back at the beginning, what, what I'm coming away with more than anything is that she's, she is kind of a, I don't want to say a higher octave of Aries because she's, she holds so much in her shadow, but maybe she is. Maybe she's a higher octave of Mars. Maybe she's a higher octave like Pluto. 
um, that holds this really uh, intense, often violent, really turbulent energy. Um, you know, there, there are forces in nature. We, we can't pick up, you know, a piece of radium. We can't get too close to the sun. It doesn't mean that the sun's bad or radium is bad. It just means that we are not capable of, of uh, interconnecting with it because it's just too powerful for us. And in some ways, I think Eris fits that bill. Um, but you see all the examples that I gave, Eris was working through some other planet, or through some other group of planets, and, and generally through the other planets, or you know, through, actually through all of them. So uh, again, I, you know, I come back to the idea that we, it needs to be stepped down. It, it's, it's, a, it, it's kind of like a transformer, a, transform, a transformative process where that energy needs to be stepped down so that it's, it's in a frequency where it's modulated at, at, a, at a degree that we can actually work with it. Daniela, I feel that we could include um, Eris as an octave transformer of Pluto and Mars, um, along with Lilith. Okay. The Lilith Trinity. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. yeah, and one more thing I wanted to say. Um, I love the way Eris exposes falseness and inauthenticity. Um, Uran she's still in a trine to Uranus, a very wide trine. And Uranus has been conjunct Eris for quite a, you know, quite a few years. And especially uh, through the tool of astrology, exposing falseness. So astrology is a, is a fantastic tool and, um, to expose in, inauthenticity or anything that is unnatural. Right. Okay. So we, have to, we have to remember, though, the trines are also a two-edged sword. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, a Pluto trine doesn't necessarily make things, you know, any better. Sometimes a Pluto trine can really blow something up. So, so it, again, I think it, it, it's like, you know, the, the basic tenet, the thing that we, did, you know, start with when we look at a chart. What, what, what is the consciousness that we're looking at? Is this a consensus, you know, individual? Is this an individuated individual? Is this a spiritualizing individual? Because that's what's going to tell us how that's going to work, you know, across the board. And uh, it's really important to have this context. And it's why, you know, I include this context. And it's why, you know, we, when we work with somebody, we ask them, what is it that you want to know? Because it gives us an idea of, of where they're at. And I, I think that, you know, Eris is certainly like that. It, it, it can be a great, you know, uh, uh, enforcing uh, or, or, or empowering um, energy. Um, if we use that passion, because I think I think I think Mars is as much passion as it is anger, and that passion sometimes turns into anger because the passion gets um, stifled. And I think that Eris was the same way. You know, in the most famous story of her, her, her she was stifled. She was, uh, you know, denied, uh, you know, the, the social social engagement with everybody else. So. You know, the story really depends on the circumstances, just like the, the planetary influences are going to depend on the individual. Absolutely. And um, I think she has expressed quite positively in my life, and um, I'm very happy with Eris. And um, so all, um, I think that could be the end of your meeting. So any final thoughts? Um, yeah, I, I would say just... Uh, I, I, would, I would say that we, we really need to pay attention to, um, I think, I think Eris works like Uranus in the sense that we, we, get, we get some kind of an inner, inner message, uh, you know, whether it's through Pallas, again, she's going to pass off her, inf her information directly to one, one of the communicators in the chart. And depending on, you know, how, that, how that's all working is going to determine how it's going to work for us and what it's going to mean for us. Excellent, Daniel. Thank you so much. And um, also thank you for presenting some really positive chart examples of Eris. And so thank you from all of us. And we're looking forward to catching you next time. Would you all please thank Daniel Fiverson. Thank you, Daniel. That was excellent as always. Thank you all. Yes, thank, thank you, Daniel. Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. Take care.